Hey folks, Winston for Carbide3D here. Fall is coming and our prototype HDM is in dire need of some exercise. So I'm going to machine a pumpkin, but not a real pumpkin and not like this lame plywood one that I made last year. I want a full metal pumpkin. In this video, I'll show you how I went about machining this piece, but I also want to talk about the capabilities of the HDM, where it shines and where you might need to hold back. We'll get into those details as examples come up. Let's get started with the project. Every project begins with a design, and this is the pumpkin vector I have to start with. I'm going to bring it into Fusion 360 and scale it to the size I want. I'm going to be cutting this design out of a 12 by 12 inch plate of aluminum, so the design has to fit within those borders. Next, I'll use the extrude tool to create both the overall pumpkin shape and the recessed areas I want in this design. Because artists and graphic designers often don't know how their designs will be scaled up or down, and what kind of end mills will be employed in cutting their designs out, it's up to the CNC user to recognize where and how large fillets and radii will need to be. I'm going to be using a quarter inch cutter for the majority of my machining, so I want any internal corners to have at least a 4mm radius, preferably a little bit more. I also want a chamfer on all of my edges, but I won't model these in here. They will be created when I make my toolpaths. Speaking of toolpaths, here's how this is going to go down. Because I'm using plate stock that I'm going to clamp in the corners, I don't want to cut out the whole pumpkin shape until the very end, so I'm going to machine as many of the internal features as possible before separating my pumpkin from the rest of the stock. The first toolpath will be an adaptive roughing toolpath constrained to the inside of the pumpkin profile. The next step is to clean up the walls and then the floors of the pockets. Machining is an underrated art form, and one of the things I like doing is choosing a toolpath for the cosmetic finish it leaves. For the carbide C in the middle of the pumpkin, I'm going to use a radial toolpath to finish the face. Before I surface the rest of the raised faces on the pumpkin, I want to make some clearance so that the toolpath can go past the borders of the pumpkin without running into extra material. Lighter cuts result in better surface finish, so I want to get that out of the way now. This outer contour toolpath is stopping 3 quarters of a millimeter from the bottom of the stock to preserve the structural integrity of the plate until I'm ready to cut the pumpkin out. I'm enabling a roughing pass for this part of the cutout so that the channel I cut will be wider than the tool itself. The toolpath is going to cut around the stock twice per step down, so it's sort of like running a finishing pass as it goes. When it comes time to separate the pumpkin from the excess stock, I'll use a contour with no roughing pass but about 2 thou of stock to leave. This will allow the tool to cut that last 3 quarters of a millimeter of material without rubbing against the walls of the stock above. This not only means less friction and less force on the pumpkin which will be held down by only double sided tape at this point, but also less force on the corner pieces of my stock which I don't want to come loose and jam the cutter or get thrown off the machine. With the pumpkin liberated and the excess stock removed, I can come back and carefully break all the edges with a chamfering toolpath. Let's see this in practice. I'm putting a couple strips of double sided tape on the bottom of my aluminum plate which was previously surfaced so I know it's dead flat. Warped materials are the kryptonite of adhesive work holding. I am also putting a small piece of tape in each corner of my stock where I'm going to clamp it. On thinner materials or as you cut through stock and it weakens, clamps will sometimes induce a bow in the stock because the corners will get pressed to the wasteboard while the middle of the stock gets pushed up by the tape. You want your stock evenly supported at all key points of pressure. With my zero set at the bottom left corner and my zero height set between 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters above the MDF to account for the thickness of the tape, I can begin machining. Here are my speeds and feeds for this adaptive toolpath. 22,000 RPM, 2,000 millimeters per minute feed rate, 1.5 millimeter optimal load, and a 2.5 millimeter depth of cut. These parameters really aren't all that crazy as I'm still learning the capabilities of the HDM, but they're still much more aggressive than anything I would run on the Shapeogo 3 or 4, and these cuts sound really solid. There are none of the hints of chatter that you might hear on a lighter weight Shapeogo. By the end of the first roughing operation, I was running at about 150% feed rate override as I gained confidence in the machine. Also, the chips coming off this machine were plenty sharp and hot enough to make you take a step back if you were in the way of the chip stream. The wall and floor finishing toolpaths sounded good as well even through the direction changes. I was hoping that the finish on this part would be a little more mirror-like, but not only was I using an older end mill, I was also still at a 150% feed rate override, so these toolpaths were faster than what I'd programmed. 
If I could do it again, I would swap in a brand new 3 flute and mill for finishing. The radial toolpath looked awesome and I was really pleased with that, and then it was time for slotting. This is traditionally my least favorite toolpath when dealing with aluminum, because narrow channels will get packed with chips and clog your cutter, or get smeared across the walls of your part ruining the surface finish. In wood or plastic, I don't really care, a dust boot and a strong vacuum will keep it from ever being an issue, so woodworkers need not worry. But in aluminum, chips are heavier and a clog cutter will ruin your day instantly. The HDM can power through aluminum in its stock configuration, but it would really benefit from a light stream of compressed air directed at the cut to clear slots and pockets of chips. I am not at the fundamental limit of what this platform is capable of, but I am near the practical limit. That's why you see me chasing the cutter with a vacuum hose and taking such a conservative cut. And this all goes into the planning you need to do when you're considering the HDM. The HDM has a 1.5 kilowatt spindle and high torque NEMA 23 stepper motors running at 36 volts. At startup, that's going to take up the majority of a 15 amp circuit's capacity. If you want to get the most from your machine, you need to budget for the electrical load of accessories and infrastructure, like a compressor or dust collector. Those things will dramatically improve your quality of life with a high-performance benchtop CNC. With the perimeter established, the HDM went on to surface the rest of the pumpkin's face and then complete the cutout. At this point, there's only double-sided tape holding the pumpkin in place, but that shouldn't be a problem because chamfering is a fairly gentle toolpath, right? Well, when it's done properly, it is a gentle operation, but in Fusion, there was a mishap when I was selecting the edges to chamfer, and the tool tried to cut on the wrong side of the edge. So I ended up slamming my chamfer tool into the face of the carbide C and engraving a partial border around the inside. I fixed the issue with the toolpath and redid my chamfer, then I exported another radial toolpath that was 0.15mm deeper than the original, and that effectively erased my chamfering mistake. At this point, I had an awesome pumpkin that I could mount on the wall, but there was a whole other side of this thing begging for some aerospace-inspired light weighting. So I modeled an isogrid pattern on the back that was pocketed down about 4mm. The toolpath strategy was largely the same as before, but with one modification. I reduced the step down of my adaptive roughing toolpath to 2mm. In a world of infinitely rigid work holding, I totally would have done an adaptive toolpath 4mm deep, but on the flip side of my pumpkin, I wouldn't have the benefit of clamps to secure my workpiece, just double-sided tape and an MDF pocket where my pumpkin would hopefully be seated snugly, but I couldn't count on the latter, just the tape. So I chose to do two gentler passes instead of a single aggressive pass. This is again one of those compromises you need to weigh with a heavier duty machine. Just because you have 1.5 kilowatts at your disposal doesn't mean you can use 1.5 kilowatts all the time. A number of factors might cause you to reevaluate how you're cutting. Your work holding might not be rigid enough, your chip evacuation might not be up to par, the material itself might not be able to hold up to those aggressive cuts. In this case, with this pumpkin, I wanted to play it safe and nail it on the first try. For all of my fears of ripping my pumpkin out of my MDF fixture though, I probably need not have worried. The pocket that I machined to receive the pumpkin, programmed to be 0.05mm oversized on all sides, was actually a perfect friction fit. After roughing and finishing, I moved on to chamfering, which was much more drama-free than my chamfering toolpath on the first side. Then I did a little bit of a commemorative engraving to give this piece a little more character in the shop. This was with a 501 PCB engraver, which should really be called the Anything Engraver because I've used this thing in a variety of materials like Mother of Pearl and Stainless Steel. This was engraved to a depth of just a couple thousandths of an inch. And with that engraving done, the heavy duty pumpkin was complete. And let me tell you, this thing is incredibly satisfying to hold. It clocks in at 714 grams or just under 1.6 pounds. My only regret is in not trying to make this pumpkin even lighter by chasing higher tolerances and thinner walls. The Fusion 360 estimate for machining the front side of the pumpkin was just under an hour and a half, the estimated time for the back half was just under an hour and ten. 
This doesn't take into account the time the CNC spends accelerating or moving to the next cut, nor does it include the time spent changing tools, but it also doesn't factor in the amount of time I spent running the machine at 150% feed rate override, so overall, this time estimate is in the right ballpark for how long it would take to machine a piece like this if everything went perfectly. Hopefully this fun little experiment gives you a taste of the capabilities of the HDM, how easily and reliably it can cut tough materials like aluminum, but also some areas where human judgment and proper investment in shop infrastructure is needed to ensure that things run smoothly. Stay tuned for more experiments with the HDM. Until next time, good luck and have fun machining, folks.